Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous video in this series, we looked at several theoretical questions surrounding the existence and uniqueness of solutions to optimization problems. Here we're going to introduce the optimality conditions that can help us find and classify solutions to optimization problems in practice. So far, we've discussed the existence and uniqueness of minima, but we haven't considered how to find a minimum. And the familiar optimization idea from calculus in one dimension is to set the first derivative to zero and then check the sign of the second derivative. And in this video, we're going to look at generalizing this to the n-dimensional case. So let's consider a function f from rn to r that's differentiable, and we can define the gradient vector, which is a function from rn to rn, that has components given by the partial derivatives of f. And the importance of the gradient is that grad f points uphill. So specifically, if we look in the direction of grad f, then the function values will be larger. And similarly, minus grad f points downhill. And to see this, let's look at Taylor's theorem for our function f from rn to r, and in a previous video, we showed that we could write that f of x plus delta is equal to f of x plus the gradient of f transpose times delta plus higher order terms. So let's consider putting delta equal to minus epsilon grad f. And here, epsilon is greater than zero. And let's suppose that grad f is non-zero. So then f of x minus epsilon grad f is equal to f of x minus epsilon grad f transpose grad f, and that will be strictly less than f. In addition, from the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, we can conclude that minus grad f is the steepest descent direction. Similarly, we see that a necessary condition for a local minimum at x star and s is that the gradient of f at x star is equal to zero. And in this case, there'll be no downhill direction at x star. The condition that the gradient of f at x star is equal to zero is called a first order necessary condition for optimality, since it only involves first derivatives. We say that a point x in s that satisfies the first order optimality condition is called a critical point of f. But of course, a critical point can be a local minimum, a local maximum, or also a saddle point. And recall that the saddle point is where some directions are downhill and some directions are uphill. And as an example, let's look at the function f of x and y, which is equal to x squared minus y squared. And 0, 0 will be a saddle point. And from this point, if we move in the x direction, then our function will increase. And if we move in the y direction, then our function will decrease. As in the one-dimensional case, we can look to second derivatives to classify critical points. And if our function f from rn to r is twice differentiable, then we can define the Hessian to be the matrix-valued function, hf from rn to rn cross n, that has components given by the second partial derivatives of f. And alternatively, we can think of the Hessian as the Jacobian matrix of the gradient of f. And if the second partial derivatives of f are continuous, then we know that the ordering of partial derivatives can be interchanged, and therefore hf will be symmetric. Suppose that we found a critical point x star, so that the gradient of f at x star is equal to zero. Then from Taylor's theorem, we have that f of x star plus delta is equal to f of x star plus the gradient of f x star transpose times delta plus a half delta transpose times hf evaluated x star plus eta delta times delta. And we know that the gradient term will vanish, so this will simplify to f of x star plus a half times delta transpose of h of f evaluated x star plus eta delta times delta where here eta is a value between 0 and 1. Let's now recall positive definiteness. And we say that a matrix A is positive definite 
if for all non-zero vectors x, x transpose times a times x is greater than a zero. And let's suppose that hf at x star is positive definite. Then by continuity, hf at x star plus eta delta will also be positive definite for sufficiently small delta. And therefore, delta transpose times hf at x star plus eta delta times delta will be greater than zero. Hence, we have that f of x star plus delta will be greater than f at x star for sufficiently small delta, and therefore x star is a local minimum. Hence, in general, positive definiteness of hf at a critical point x star is a second order sufficient condition for a local minimum. A matrix can also be negative definite if x transpose ax is less than zero for all non-zero x, and it can also be indefinite where there exists x and y such that x transpose ax is less than zero and y transpose ay is greater than zero. Therefore, we can classify critical points as follows. If hf of x star is positive definite, then x star is a local minimum. If hf of x star is negative definite, then x star is a local maximum. And if hf of x star is indefinite, then x star is a saddle point. In addition, positive definiteness of the Hessian is closely related to the convexity of f. And if hf of x is positive definite, then f is convex on some convex neighborhood of x. And if hf is positive definite for all x in s, where s is a convex set, then f is convex on s. So we can ask ourselves the question, how do we test for positive definiteness? And the answer is that A is positive definite if and only if all of the eigenvalues of A are positive. And similarly, if A is negative definite, then that will be if and only if all of the eigenvalues are negative. In addition, a matrix with positive and negative eigenvalues is indefinite. Hence, we can compute the eigenvalues of A and check their signs. To illustrate this procedure, let's look at a function f of a two-component vector x defined as 2x1 cubed plus 3x1 squared plus 12x1 x2 plus 3x2 squared minus 6x2 plus 6. And if we calculate the gradient of f, then we find that it has terms up to quadratic in x1 and linear in x2. And to find critical points of f, we would have to set the gradient equal to zero, and typically we would have to solve that using a nonlinear root finding iteration. But here, our gradient is simple enough that we can do this analytically, and we find that there are two critical points at one comma minus one and two comma minus three. We can now evaluate the Hessian of f, and we find that it has components of 12x1 plus six, 12, 12 and 6. And if we evaluate the Hessian at 1 comma minus 1, then we find that it has eigenvalues of 25.4 and minus 1.4. And if we evaluate the Hessian at 2 comma minus 3, we find that it has eigenvalues of 35 and 1. And therefore, based on the signs of the eigenvalues, we can conclude that 2 comma minus 3 is a local minimum and 1 comma minus 1 is a saddle point. And let's now look at a few plots of our function f to confirm that this is the case. Let's begin by looking at a 3D surface plot of our example function. And I've chosen the axis ranges here to contain the two critical points that we just found. And if we start to rotate around this function, then we see that it has the form of a u-shaped valley. And if we move off from the valley base, then we see the function values on the valley sides start to rapidly increase up to around 70 or 80 for these particular axis range choices. And because of this large vertical range, it's actually rather difficult to make out the critical points that we expect are located in the valley base. 
However, we can see one dark region that we expect corresponds to the local minimum at 2 comma minus 3. So to get an alternative viewpoint on this function, let's now look at a contour plot. And here I'm showing linearly spaced contours where our function value is equal to 2n for integer n. And one difficulty with linearly spaced contours is that the contours become tightly packed together on the valley sides. However, in the region that we are most interested in, in the valley base, the contours are far apart. And an alternative way to plot contours is to look at a non-uniform spacing, where we look where the function value is equal to f min plus n squared divided by 16, and here we choose f min to be the value of the function at our local minimum. And this particular choice clusters more contours in the valley base and shows more detail. And in this plot, we can now clearly make out the saddle point that's located at 1, minus 1, and our function value is 8 there. And we can also clearly make out our local minimum that is located at 2, minus 3, and our function value is 7 there, and that also sets the f min that we used in the contour spacing. So these plots confirm the results that we calculated analytically.